Good afternoon all and welcome to this St Andrews Speech and Language Therapy webinar on Wednesday the 6th of March 2024 titled Navigating Communication and Emotional Rousal Levels Principles and Practical Applications in Psychiatric Settings. Today we welcome Kimberly Ferrari, Lead Speech and Language Therapist and Leanne Clement, Head of Allied Health Professionals, both from St Andrews Healthcare. Kim and Leanne will talk for 45 minutes, allowing a 15 minute Q&A at the end. Throughout the live webinar, you will be able to post your questions on the Q&A section in the control panel. We will look to answer as many questions as we can. We cannot, however, promise to answer questions that are submitted following the live webinar. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on the St Andrews website and YouTube page within the next few days. This webinar has been designed following an article in the Neuro Rehab Times on speech and language therapy in mental health, which you can access by scanning the QR code on the slides using your phone cameras. In the field of occupational therapy and speech and language therapy, effective communication is at the core of successful interventions. However, communication can be significantly impacted by emotional arousal levels, both in clients and practitioners. This webinar will explore some of these principles from understanding the neurobiological reasons to learning practical strategies for application of an arousal curve plan. So without further ado, I will now invite Kim and Leanne to talk us through some of these principles. <clears throat> Hi, so my name is Kim. As Adam said, I'm the lead speech and language therapist at St Andrews Healthcare. Um, I have experience working across most of all of our divisions, so neuropsychiatry, ASD, LD, CAMS and our adult mental health wards. Hi, yeah, I'm Leanne and I'm the uh, head of allied health professions. As Adam said, um, my background is in, in occupational therapy um, and we are, as a charity, starting to understand sensory integration a lot more and how it works around communication. So I'm here to present that element of it. Mm -hmm. So just to start off, uh, for those of you who may not have heard of St Andrews before, um, established in 1838, it's a charity that for 185 years has supported people to live well with complex mental health needs. So we're based in Northampton, but we also have sites in Birmingham and Essex. And we deliver specialist inpatient and community mental health care services for people living with complex brain injury, progressive neurological conditions, mental illness, learning disabilities and autism. And our charitable purpose is overall to relieve suffering, to give hope and to promote recovery. So as Adam said at the beginning, the purpose of this um, webinar is, is to follow up from the article that we did for the Neuro Rehab Times, thinking about how communication changes with arousal levels. So I'm going to start by explaining the relationship between communication and arousal levels. I'm not going to go into too much detail about what communication is, um, because I, I am aware that we're limited for time and also a lot of the people on the call are speech and language therapists. But in brief, it's the process of exchanging information, ideas, thoughts or feelings between individuals and groups through various means such as speech, writing, gestures, signs or technology. But it's not only the transmission of a message, it's also ensuring that the message is accurately understood and is relevant to the people that are engaged in that conversation. So on the screen here, I've, I've got um, just a quick graphic that talks through the Grice's maxims. So Grice was a philosopher who identified that these four main maxims um, were a set of conversational principles that describe the implicit expectations that we have when we're engaging in conversations with people. So these play a significant role in, gu in guiding effective communication. If we adhere to these maxims, then communication tends to be smooth, efficient and beneficial. 
Whereas if we violate any of these maxims, that's when it leads to confusion, misunderstandings and breakdowns in communication. Communication is intri uh, intricately linked to behaviour as it influences how individuals express themselves, interact with others, adhere to social norms, resolve conflicts, respond to influence and shape their own self-concept and identity. So effective communication skills are essential for fostering positive behavioural outcomes in various post personal, social and professional contexts. Um, we've got another QR code here that would take you to guidance from the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapy, which goes into a bit more detail on the links between communication and behaviour. But as you can see here with the stats on the right, a high percentage of people who um, either have behavioural uh, disorders or have come in contact with the justice system have communication needs. So we can see that clear link. Positive behaviour support plans are comprehensive plans designed to address and manage behaviours that challenge. So these plans focus on promoting positive behaviours whilst minimising or eliminating behaviours that challenge through a structured and proactive approach. So the plans aim to teach individuals alternative safe behaviours to replace um, the ones that challenge. And that may involve teaching communication skills, coping strategies or implementing sensory strategies. And what we can see here is that communication is listed as a proactive strategy. So that's basically recognising that if we can support people's communication needs, that is a proactive step that we can take rather than being reactive and waiting until um, it's too late and, and behaviours have escalated. So what is the arousal curve and why do we see challenging behaviours instead of other means of communication? I mentioned the arousal curve in the Neuro Rehab Times article, but I think it fully makes sense when you can see it visually. So it's a graphic example of how our communication presentation changes based on our emotional arousal levels. And it clearly explains why we might see some behaviours that challenge as a form of communication, if that's all that's available to that individual at that time. So our arousal levels are the black line that you can see going up and down. And when this is in the green window, we are in our optimal communication window. So this means that we're communicating as we typically would. As soon as our arousal levels start to increase, you can see that that black line leaves that optimal communication window and you're no longer communicating in a way that you typically would. So this happens to all of us. For example, if you're in an interview, uh, or if you're doing a webinar, you might get very anxious and you might uh, find that you suddenly can't remember what people are telling you or you can't find the correct words. Um, however, if an individual already has some speech, language and communication needs, then that threshold to leave that communication window is going to be a lot lower. So in St Andrews, we have a number of individuals who may regularly get to the crisis section of this model. During an incident on the ward, their communication skills are going to be different to what staff are typically used to experiencing when interacting with them day to day. For example, they may not be able to process what staff are saying anymore. You can also see on this graph that the line doesn't immediately drop back down into that green window. It does take time. So we need to create opportunities to communicate after an incident, but recognise that if we apply too much pressure to communicate verbally, that actually that's going to probably lead to an increase in challenging behaviours again. So the arousal curve model was originally drew, um, drawn up by someone called Arnett and then adopted later by Hewitt. Um, and it's often used as a teaching tool and has also been linked to approaches such as interact, um, intensive interaction in the past. So the original model plots the progress of arousal with incidences of violence most likely to occur near the peak and that what we mean by increasing arousal is sort of escalating feelings of anger, frustration, anxiety or fear for example. Um, there's no particular time frame to the sequence so there's no precision as to where one stage ends and the other begins so some people may take three seconds to get from triggering to crisis whereas for other people it might take three days. And it's also worth noting that lower, low arousal states can impact communication negatively too. So you might then be thinking about a, 
um, an arousal curve in the inverse. And what you can see in this model is there is a drop below the communication window at the end, which tends to be linked to feelings of um, guilt or apathy. Again, there is a QR code here to download a blank version of the arousal curve, um, but the QR code will pop up again later if you haven't had the time to scan it. So the demands and capacity model was originally a framework to understand stuttering, and it proposed that stuttering occurs when the demands placed on an individual speech production system exceeded its capacity to meet those demands effectively. So this model suggests that various factors, including linguistic, cognitive, emotional and motoric demands can contribute to an imbalance between demands and capacity. So demands tend to be the external and internal pressures present in a given situation. So that might be social expectations, environmental factors, uh, uh, interpersonal interactions. And the capacity is the individual's internal resource or abilities to meet those demands. So that tends to be your cognitive abilities, your emotional regulation skills, your self-awareness and your interpersonal skills. So if we consider this in the context of the arousal curve, when the emotional arousal levels leave the optimal communication window, we're saying that the capacity of the individual then becomes reduced. It's therefore useful to consider how we can lessen the demands of the environment to be able to regain that balance and work towards optimal communication. So we'll be talking later on about how we can do that in a therapeutic way. So what do we actually mean when we talk about emotional arousal? We're going to play a quick video which talks about the three main parts of the brain. So hopefully you should hear this when I click play. Now, you probably know the name Dan Siegel. He's one of the giants in the field of interpersonal neurobiology. And Dan came up with a lovely hand model of the human brain. So let's kind of go through the hand model of the brain. And this can be useful for you to understand, but at times it might be useful for you to actually share this with your client. The wrist, the forearm coming up to here is like your spinal cord. And right here at the, uh, the end of the wrist is like the base of your skull. And here, the bottom of your palm, this is like the reptile brain, the life support system of the brain. So, you know, if the rest of your brain is wiped out through, say, for example, a stroke or a car accident, this life support part of your brain, the reptile brain, can still keep your body alive, can still keep all your organs functioning and your breath and your heart and so forth. And this is where a lot of autonomic nervous system operates and stems from this reptile brain. Now, above the reptile brain is the mammalian brain, often called the limbic brain or the emotional brain. So reptiles, you know, they've got the fight or flight response or they've got the freeze, shut down, flop and drop response, but they don't really have anything that is even remotely close to the, the complex emotional states that we see in mammals. And the limbic brain has many different parts to it, but two in particular that we'll be looking at in this course are the amygdala and the hippocampus. Now, don't worry about memorizing those terms for now. We will revisit them later. But this kind of is the, the middle brain, the limbic brain, the mammalian brain, basically responsible for emotions. Now, on top of the limbic mammalian emotional brain, you've got the cerebral cortex, the thinking cap of the brain. The cerebral cortex is much thicker in mammals, but especially so in primates and particularly so in human beings more so than any other primate. And this cerebral cortex, the thinking part of the brain responsible for consciousness and cognition. And right at the front of the cerebral cortex, you have the prefrontal cortex, the part of your brain that's right up here at the front of your forehead, above your eyes. And particularly important to us is the medial prefrontal cortex, this bit in the middle right at the front, this bit up here. This plays a very important role in mindfulness and awareness. So let's just go through it again. You've got your spinal cord, you've got your reptile brain. Underneath your cerebral cortex, you've got your mammalian brain with the amygdala, the hippocampus, responsible for emotions. And then you've got your cerebral cortex, your thinking cap of the brain on top, and the medial prefrontal cortex right here in the center at the front, right there. 
So that video, I'm sure a lot of us might have heard of lizard brain or monkey brain, those sort of terminologies before. And I think that video just sums up nicely, but also it gives a good tool to maybe start explaining that to some of our the people that we work with as well. So as a child, your brain develops sequentially as described in the previous video. So your prefrontal cortex is actually still developing until you're 25. If an individual has experienced developmental trauma, this will affect how their brain has developed. So if trauma is experienced while some of these areas are still developing, it can disrupt the formation of the healthy neural pathways and it can affect with the regulation of emotions and stress responses. This means when people get re-traumatized or triggered, they can revert back to those earlier developed primitive um, or limbic brain stages. So when thinking about the arousal curve again, when people are outside of their optimal communication window, they're no longer using their cortical brain. So they are using their limbic or their primitive brain. Um, we cannot access our cortical brain if our limbic and primitive brain are dysregulated, which therefore means that we can't meaningfully access language, reflection, learning and reasoning skills when we're in um, this level of arousal. So the neurosequential model of therapeutics emphasises the importance of starting with basic regulatory capacities before targeting those higher order cognitive functions. So again, if we think back to our demands and capacity model, the capacity in our cortical brain is reduced. Therefore, we need to reduce the demand in the limbic and the primitive brain to be able to balance out those scales. So I would recommend following the link on the QR code posted on this page. Um, it will take you through to Beacon House resources and you can learn a lot more about um, trauma informed care over there because that could be a whole webinar in itself. Um, but there's lots of useful um, resources over there that, that link nicely into what we've been talking about today. So when thinking about stress, various brain regions, such as the amygdala, which we heard earlier, and the prefrontal cortex, play crucial roles in processing emotions and regulating those arousal levels. Additionally, hormonal responses and neurotransmitters such as cortisol and serotonin influence emotional reactivity and regulation, which will impact on our communication, which will impact our communication and behaviour. So when stimulated by an emotional stimuli, the amygdala initiates a cascade of physiological responses, um, which includes the rele release of hormones uh, such as adrenaline and cortisol. And that's what starts activating the body's stress response system. So adrenaline increases the heart rate and blood pressure and prepares the body for action, whilst cortisol enhances um, glucose metabolism and suppresses non-essential functions. So elevated cortisol levels can impair the prefrontal cortex functioning. So this is the brain region that's crucial for executive functions such as decision making, attention, control and cognitive flexibility, all of which are important for language processing. So if it's suppressing all of these functions, we're going to see difficulties in organising thoughts, difficulties maintaining focus um, and difficulties adapting your language in different contexts. And chronic stress and elevated cortisol levels um, are going to lead to difficulties with communication, therefore, so difficulties with verbal fluency, word retrieval, um, and many people who are experiencing these high levels of stress may find it hard to articulate their thoughts coherently and may experience disruptions in their ability to understand and respond to cues from other people. So I'm now going to pass over to Leanne, who's going to talk a little bit about polyvagal theory. Hi, yeah. So, yeah. So before we move on to sensory approaches, which is um, what I've joined the webinar for, I just wanted to briefly to upon polyvagal theory because this is something that we tend to use when we are thinking about sensory approaches and stress response. So Kim's already sp spoken about the importance of communication and that when we understand and that we understand that when somebody starts to experience stress they'll move out of that window of tolerance for effective communication and into a stress response. And what polyvagal theory has helped some OTs in the charity think about is the fight flight response fight flight freeze response so how our vagus nerve tells our brain when we are safe or when we are in perceived or actual threat 
and we then respond accordingly to that. So when we are feeling safe we are in what is the green zone so social engagement and when we are experience, um, experiencing a greater sense of stress our arousal levels increase and we might experience fight flight or freeze um, and what the polyvagal theory can do is help professionals think about this response and how it might impact behavior and emotion and connection with the world and others so it gives us ideas about the importance of creating safe spaces safe relationships how we support people to move back into social engagement feeling connected and feeling safe again so it's something that we often use in ot and if you oh when we've overlaid it over onto over the arousal curve what you can see is it's actually really some clear similarities in that social engagement obviously means that somebody is in their optimum communication window and they're feeling safe and secure so what we need to understand is when people are entering fight flight freeze when their arousal levels are increasing how do we support them to move back out into the green zone and the way we can do that one of the ways is through sensory approaches and just before i start talking about sensory approaches i am not sensory integration trained but actually everything that i'm going to be talking about are all things that i've done in practice over the last five six years so yes it's really important to have sensory integration practitioners and we do have those in the charity but it's also important to recognize that actually anybody can pick up some of these approaches and use them when we feel that we might be working with people that are struggling to regulate their arousal levels or in a state of crisis so how do sensory approaches help us regain optimal communication so sensory approaches aim to support individuals in achieving the right sensory input through regulating the information they receive. And that can be done through various approaches, activities and tools. Um, and I think within St Andrews, what we've noticed is that the people we work with, they do become distressed and they can feel or are in environments that can feel unsafe for them. And so crisis can occur, which unfortunately can at times result in res restrictive practices. And our, our, our whole aim here is to reduce restrictive practices um, and one of the key de-escalation de strategies is sensory approaches. It helps people and we've had HCAs and other members of staff say it, it helps give practical de-escalation strategies and practical tools to reduce in restrictive practices. And also, I think it's really important to recognise that many of our patients have experienced trauma and also have sensory related disorders on top of other conditions. And so not only may they struggle when they are feeling stressed or in threat, but actually they struggle in their day to day lives. And again, sensory strategies can help with regulating in, in day to day living. Um, and then finally, there's a lot of evidence to show that having so having safe spaces, sensory resources, sensory rooms, calm down rooms, whatever we might call them, actually really helps, again, reduce arousal levels, helps to pe for people to feel safe and regain a sense of calm and then potentially access those cognitive strategies again. Um, and I guess just before I move on, I, I think it's really important to note that we are looking at crises or increased arousal in this webinar, but actually the most poignant time to to explore sensory approaches with patients are when they are in, car in a calm and alert state so when they're feeling safe when they're feeling connected those are the times that we can start to explore what's helpful for someone what helps them reduce stress and um, help support them to return to engagement and connection and again with sensory approaches if if not si trained it's patient-led so it's how we work alongside and with the patient to understand their preferences so I'm just going to briefly touch upon the eight senses, just for those who might not be aware. So we have eight senses that all play a vital role in ensuring we re remain alert, regulated and balanced. So we have the five senses that I think the majority of us will be aware of. So tactile, olfactory, gustatory, um, auditory and visual. And then we have three other senses. So proprioception, which is the awareness of body in space and the strength we need to complete actions. And those receptors are within our muscles and joints. We have vestibular, which is sense of balance and spatial orientation. And those receptors are in our ears. And then interoception, which is uh, probably the sense that's being most researched at the moment in relation to stress response, trauma, 
um, and mental health is interoception and that is the awareness of our internal body state through our organs and how our brain understands that. So sensory modulation as a as a practical strategy. So often the people that we've worked with, as I've stated earlier, and Kim has as well, have experienced trauma and may have sensory related disorders, which means they, they will find it hard to regulate sensory information and their response to this information. So we may see people that act incongruently to the um, environment or situation they're in because of their sensory processing. And that might be that people need day to day support. So an easy way that I've um, taught HCAs and OT technical instructors is to think about our brain as a traffic warden um, and, that, and that, that's how they organise and direct traffic. So the brain is our traffic warden directing traffic in lots of different directions and different speeds. And the information we get is the, are the sensory receptors. So the traffic is the sensory receptor. And when the warden isn't functioning properly, they can send traffic to the wrong location, too quickly, too slowly and from all different directions. So what we see is that somebody can find it really hard to process the outside world and the senses they're experiencing. And what OTs do is we use neuroscience and sensory theory to start noticing those misdirections with the patient through observations, through activity and through treatment. And we try to find solutions again with the patient to reroute or organise the way in which their body processes that information. So essentially what we're looking to do is help sort out the packages onto the right conveyor belts. And that can help people to start regulating their arousal levels in order to then access their thinking cap um, and their cognitive functions. So I'll give an example. So interoception. So the brain detects a physiological change to the body's internal state, and that is through interoception. An example for those of you who are scared of spiders, I appreciate this might not be for everybody, but we see a spider, our body reacts through tensing muscles, heart racing, becoming sweaty, and then we might associate these bodily cues with the feeling of fear. And then our reaction might be to scream, run away, throw something at the spider. For those of you who aren't scared of spiders, you won't have that reaction and you won't get those bodily cues. But what's important is that if we are able to effectively process our body cues and those somatic markers so somatic markers are the bodily cues we can then start to understand the feeling and the action attached to that and what we often find in settings like say Andrews or people who have experienced trauma or threat is that actually they aren't able to process that information and they they don't understand their internal state so we might find people who are hypo or hyposensitive to their inner body and we might see this through overwhelming inner experiences or people just not noticing bodily cues so somebody becoming angry and not realizing that actually they're becoming angry and entering crisis so their traffic officer essentially isn't controlling the flow of direction and you can see that this is closely related to polyvagal theory in terms of processing difficulties can lead to a sense of disconnection, can lead to a sense of lack of safety um, and put people in flight or fright or freeze. And some examples um, of treatment could be around restoring connection with the body. So mindfulness about how the body's feeling. It might be engaging in meaningful activity that encourages understanding the inner body, um, playfulness, uh, safe environments, connecting with others. And then as people are able to cognitively function, start to look at interoceptive exposure, mindfulness and those kind of things. And I, I think the easiest way to understand it is if we think about some of the feelings we have towards our, our bodily cues. So if we think about our tummy rumbling, we link that to hunger. If we think of pressure on our bladder, we might link that to using the loo. Nausea for some of us might be disgust or nervousness. We talk about butterflies. Rapid heart rate might be fear or anxiety. Um, and when we work with the people we work with, often they don't they don't make those connections and they don't recognise those somatic markers. So I won't go through this slide too much because I think this has been really well discussed. But essentially, it's putting it all together. So. What OTs um, and other professionals understand is that when somebody is in a state of stress, we have to talk to the reptile part of the brain. It's no good talking to the other parts of the brain because people aren't able to access. So 
it's almost like the Maslow's hierarchy of needs in that we need to we need to talk to the the bottom before we start to want to engage the top so when you hear people say just listen to me or let's talk about this or let's let's think think mindfully about our emotions people can't and it can in fact increase agitation or anxiety so what we need to do is address the lizard brain and we need to use um that we can use sensory activities to do that to address blood pressure to address heart rate body temperature releasing adrenaline so it's re sensory approaches can be really effective in doing that so what i'm going to do is just give some practical solutions um so kim just if you go to the next slide sorry um so if we think about that triangle the bottom three senses were proprioception vestibular and tactile so i'm just going to very briefly go through those three different uh, senses and see what we can do practically when somebody is in a sense of stress so proprioception um, is through the muscles and joints and so any activity that aids us to release muscle tension can support someone back to a calm and alert state so during if we think of aggression in particular during a build-up or a crisis someone might be feeling angry their jaw might be clenching their fists might be clenching they might be pacing up and down we can't ignore this. We need to help them release this adrenaline. And so what we need to do is find activities that do that and release that adrenaline. So anything that has big gross motor skills, anything that offers deep pressure to the muscles can be really calming and can help someone reconnect. So and again, you want to make these sorts of plans when somebody's in calm and alert. So it might be that they identify that um, press ups against the wall are really good. I've had patients uh, get Swiss balls and throw them at walls so safe space go and throw it at a wall and actually those big movements and throwing can help release that adrenaline and start to help someone feel calm and alert um then we've got i think we've got vestibular as the next one. Oh, tactile <laughs> um so tactile is an interesting one because it is at the bottom of the pyramid but we need to be aware that tactile can be calming or alerting for somebody so that we have both calming and alerting receptors um, so for people that have possibly experienced trauma may find it really re-traumatizing really and may find touch really alerting and stressful but for others it's incredibly calming so again you would explore that with the person when they're in calm and alert to understand their preferences but what touch can do is it really taps into that human nature of comfort and the need for touch it's a basic human function um and so when we think about mothers and children, partners, hugging and closeness, they're all very calming and grounding activities. In our area of work, it can be really hard because actually we have to maintain professional boundaries and some patients may find um, those boundaries quite difficult to navigate. But there are different options. So we've done things like uh, we've used fidgets or we've encouraged people to hug Swiss balls again really tightly, um, peddly teddies uh weighted blankets those kind of things anything that can provide a sense of hug and the other thing that's really good is ice so people who um have experience with dbt dialectical behavioral therapy will know about tip skills and using ice on the wrists and the neck which can help with body temperature and also that tac that tactile element so there's some examples of tactile and then finally vestibular so Vestibular is particularly good with anxiety and helping somebody to become alert again. Um, so those receptors are, are in our ears. We need to be quite careful with vestibular because the calming element is in the lateral movement of the head. So anything where you are rocking side to side or moving is calming, but bouncing can be alerting. So getting someone on a trampoline or something like that can be alerting but what we found and you I often see patients uh, rocking backwards and forwards as a way of self-soothing so you can adapt that and use that 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 might be something that they sit on a Swiss ball and they rock backwards and forwards as a way of calming um, and again act, they are activities that can make us challenge or work on our sense of balance and coordination can help to reduce anxiety so anything where we're getting people to balance and use coordination can help people come back into an alert and calm state 
And then just before I finish my bit on sensory approaches, I just wanted to get my OT bit in here and say that I think what's really important as well is sometimes people get really overwhelmed with the different types of activities, whether it could be right or wrong, whether it could cause any harm. And I think I think it's actually really important to recognise that any activity can be used. So if we go back to polyvagal theory and we go back to interoception, actually activities that are playful, help people connect, um, restore social engagement and are meaningful to people that have a calming effect will help people in crisis. So we've done lots of things around just engaging in mindful colouring or sometimes picking up someone's Tai Chi sheet and doing Tai Chi with them or connecting through music or a cup of tea or just really basic stuff um, can also support bringing people back down into a calm and alert state. Awesome, thank you. So we're going to move on to the principles of navigating communication sort of across the different arousal levels. So remembering this graph, we need to remember that our communication support that we offer uh, may need to change based on an individual's arousal levels um, so that we can keep them at the social engagement level for longer. So at the top of this black line, during a crisis, we need to be thinking about the brainstem. We need to support effective communication through environmental strategies and probably sensory strategies before we can then work up to the cortical brain again. So the start of this graph shows why verbal de-escalation skills are useful when you start to see triggering behaviours, because that individual is still within their optimal communication window. So they're going to be able to process what you're telling them and respond. As an instant progresses, verbal de-escalation is going to start to become less and less effective. So where someone's in a slightly lower arousal state, this is where we need to foster that engagement and that motivation. So um, when we use this as a training tool with staff, um, we highlight that this is the important stage for trying to prevent further escalation. So we need to communicate at a level that the person can access because if they can engage in that communication and they can communicate how they're feeling and what they're thinking, then they're less likely to become frustrated, have communication breakdowns or misunderstand situations. So it's simple things like having open body language, still using short, simple, clear sentences so that you can be understood. Think about what helps keep them calm and relaxed and trying to focus on the positive where possible. And also if there are communication guidelines in place for a patient, this is where we need to be using them um, because the idea is that if we can support someone's communication consistently, then hopefully we wouldn't see that escalation um, of arousal and behaviour. So in the middle of this graph, this is where we're having to manage the crisis. So um, this is sort of the peak of the intense feelings. This is where people might become dysregulated and we might start to see some destructive behaviours either to property to other people or to themselves or we might see things like avoidance so at this stage when we're using this with staff um it's really highlighting that your job at this stage is just to keep that person safe um so we need to avoid too much talking um so we need to use sensory approaches grounding techniques familiar simple words or phrases we know that comprehension dips in the high arousal state, so we need to use uh, focus on sort of the here and now, focus on orientation and use very simple sentences. We want to reduce auditory input, so only have one person talking at a time. Recognise that now is not the time for problem solving. And now is not the time for questioning and, to, and for figuring out why. Um, and also recognising that verbal output can dip in high arousal states. Um, as we've seen the impact of cortisol on that prefrontal cortex. So we need to be offering non-verbal ways of communicating, whether that be gestures, makaton, just pointing, or they might have communication cards and books available to them. And then right at the end of the graph is where we're starting to think about recovery and debrief. So this is where arousal levels are starting to come down. They're starting to regulate their emotions again, and they're hopefully going back into that green communication window. And when we think about debriefs, we still want to think, we don't want to ask too many high level questions, because actually you're probably still trying to figure out if they're coming down into the green window or whether they're in that green window. So try to avoid the whys and the how questions. Um, 
immediately after an incident. We want to create those opportunities and means for communication. So thinking about means, reasons, opportunity model. Um, if we've just had an incident, that's probably the reason to communicate, but we need to be able to provide those opportunities and means. Trying to make it a positive experience where possible and be comfortable with silence. Um, because if an individual is struggling to communicate post incident, this could lead to an increase in challenging behaviours if they're not supported. So when we say about debriefing, we need to make sure that they are meaningful. So if they become a tick box activity, it's not going to be effective. And we're going to start seeing cyclical behaviour um, and that feeling like you're stuck in a rut. So the key thing really is in, is making sure it's accessible to be effective. So how we talk about our feelings is really important and we need to use tools and strategies to support this and to support learning from past situations. So a member of my team, Ellis, did a CQI project here at St Andrews um, looking at accessible debrief forms and she found that even people who did not have overt language difficulties preferred the more accessible versions that were being offered. And I I would say it's probably just like most of us here. I'd much rather a visual sort of pictorial instructions from IKEA than a big block of written instructions. So we've got a few things here that we use at St Andrews. So the first on the left is, is a sort of visual breakdown of a CBT model of thinking about your thoughts, your feelings and how that influences behaviour. The next is sort of a narrative structure breaking down um, rather than just saying what happened, breaking it down to exactly the different parts of a narrative. And then we've got something that looks a bit like comic strip conversations on the right, which can help people to recognise other people's thoughts and feelings in a situation as well. So now we're going to talk about the arousal curve um, in terms of making it with uh, an individual. So we've talked about how staff how the arousal curve can explain how staff should be communicating, uh, but it can also be an active therapy tool. So this graph demonstrates the different levels of input that speech and language therapy offer, which I'm sure most people have seen in terms of specialist, targeted and universal. Completion of an arousal curve means that a shorter term specialist approach can be used to create something more universally applicable to support the individual to communicate to the best of their ability. So we need to be able to reflect on how this intervention can be adapted for broader use, which will help to develop more generalised strategies that are still addressing those speech, language and communication needs, but outside of our SLT sessions. So if we think about stretched SLT services, I think the creation of an arousal curve um, is quite an efficient way to have a large impact on the individual's ability to communicate and to understand their individual communication style and how it might change from day to day, because that can be quite confusing for some people. So this is the same QR code that popped up earlier. So if you do want a blank copy of the worksheet, you can scan that and it will download. When we work with an individual, we aim to complete a chart like this with the relevant information added in through our sessions. It's important to use the language that the individual uses. So for example, um, this person may not have liked the language crisis and recovery, and they may have their own way of labelling this. So for this person, they've chosen incident and come down. As well as having the table out in our session, we will always have this chart present in our sessions on the table too. Our sessions typically start with an explanation of what this chart means, similar to how I've explained it to you, but obviously adapted to suit the language and cognitive abilities of the individual. And as well as changing the labels on the table, we encourage the individual to edit the graph itself. So we'll have people scribble all over it, changing the terms, but also changing the shape of the graph itself. So it's often a great way to actually check that they've understood your explanation of what the graph means if they're able to adapt it to suit their own situation. So in this example, the individual felt that their build up section was much quicker than the graph suggested and so drew a sharper incline. And they also felt that if they were not successfully de-escalated, that they were in a crisis mode for a lot longer than the graph suggested. So they drew a longer line at the top. They then felt that the recovery time was similar, but actually they had a deeper dip a few days later into a lower arousal state, as they often felt a large amount of guilt or shame and withdrawal. And they commented that this lasted longer before they were able to optimally communicate again. 
And finally, a lot of patients find it helpful to explicitly colour the terms along the bottom to match the colours that we're using in the table so we can make those direct links between the table we're producing and the graph that we're referencing. And you could also change the colours to link in with potential other interventions that are being completed, such as um, zones of regulation. So I'm going to um, talk through these boxes quite quickly because I believe you'll have the, the slides later. But what we tend to do is we go through one box at a time with the individual. So right now I'm starting at the triggering stage, but actually some people find it really helpful to start at the crisis stage and move backwards and to think backwards about oh, what happened just before that and what happened just before that. Um, so with the support of the arousal curve itself, we would be asking about when you're when you feel triggered or whatever language they're using, what will staff start to see? So what happens to your communication when you start feeling these maybe small feelings of anger or anxiety or irritation? What might people see um, and how might that change your communication? So we're not necessarily asking about what triggers them, but that could be an additional part of, of this care plan as we move forward. Now we'd move on to the build up stage. So say no one's noticed that you've mentioned uh, the things you've mentioned in that triggering stage and you can feel yourself getting more angry and more anxious. What are people going to see then? How are you communicating at this stage? So, for example, this individual at the triggering stage, they've said they might start talking about my dog who died. That's obviously something maybe a comforting conversation or a familiar conversation that they have. Um, but if staff don't recognise that that means that they're starting to escalate, then the next stage they say it will take them a long time to process what people say. They find it hard to think straight and to move and they'll start to not look at anyone. Now we're at the crisis point. So again, maybe the two boxes have previously not been identified. What are staff going to see when you're in crisis point? And I think this is where we start to we get really uh, interesting responses from our service users. Um, and this is an a, this is an example of sort of multiple different responses we've had from different people. So when we say what's happening to your communication at that point, a lot of people will say, you know, if staff ask if I'm OK, I might nod, but actually I'm not OK. So asking me if I'm OK is actually a bit pointless. A lot of people will say things like I can hear, but I can't listen and that their brain feels a bit like a sieve or that their brain feels switched off. Um, and they might verbalise things that they don't actually mean because it's almost just like a reflexive action. And in the recovery stage, so we're saying the worst of it's over, maybe an anxiety, the anxiety feelings are subsiding. How are you communicating now? Do you feel like your communication instantly goes back to normal? How is it different to normal? So an example of some of the things we get is maybe your speech feels like it's in slow motion. Some people say it takes a full day for my communication to feel normal again. Some people avoid talking about what's happened because they're still feeling those guilty or um, uh, yeah, guilty feelings. So then we move on to how staff can help. So how can staff adapt their communication? What has worked in the past and what hasn't worked in the past? And we don't want to think about it generally. We want to try and get it into these different stages of arousal because we recognise that support needs to adapt. Um, so as we move through, you find that people have differing opinions on, on, on what works. So, for example, at the crisis stage for this individual, they don't want staff to repeat things because actually they said they can hear. They just can't process it. So if someone's continually repeating something, it's just more and more that they can't process. Um, so it was really important for people to be able to have that explained to staff. Things like don't force me to speak verbally. If I need to make choices, show me pictures. Whereas right down at the triggering stage, this individual can engage in one to one um, conversation and can communicate verbally. So again, it's showing the differences in their communication ability there. And then you can work with other members of the MDT like OT um, to add additional strategies to work at each stage. I don't know Leanne if you had any. I think um, people could probably take a look at that afterwards but it's just some um, examples that we've had from 
people that we've worked with yeah. um, where they've highlighted things that have worked for them at the different stages and we often incorporate that into the PBS um, so the positive behavioural support plan so that staff can use those during those different stages. So ideally this piece of work is for the patients to be actively involved in, so their participation is important to be able to, de to develop their autonomy. So allowing them to have autonomy empowers them to participate actively in the process and take control of their care and treatment. Um, and this sense of empowerment can enhance motivation and engagement and can then lead to better outcomes. So we recognise that every patient is unique. We might see some similarities, but what works for one individual may not work for another. And granting that autonomy enables the patient to personalise the approaches based on their specific needs and preferences, which will lead to a more tailored and effective treatment plan. I think as well, by promoting autonomy, it also gives them a greater sense of ownership over their progress, which can boost their confidence and their self-esteem. Um, as they see themselves making choices that are working directly towards their therapy goals. And it also ultimately helps them become better advocates for themselves in other areas of their lives. So they learn to communicate their needs, their preferences and their concerns effectively within these sessions with us, which can be beneficial for various aspects of their lives. So just a few things to consider. Um, it's a fairly metacognitive task, so you are having to think about thinking. It also requires you to have fairly good recall of events, so people with memory impairments would struggle with this. I often have people ask if they could use talking mats, which I think is a great idea to sort to generate some ideas of, of what might help. Um, but you do need to be careful that that could end up being putting words in their mouth um, and it might not be a true reflection of their experience. But it might be that you observe an incident and you can pull examples. So I noticed that you isolated yourself in the corner. Why do you think that was? And try to elicit responses. For example, they might be avoiding noises. They might not be able to formulate sentences at that time. But if you can't do it with that individual because of their cognition, then you could complete it as an MDT. We also need to think about timing. So can they reflect back to an incident? As Leanne said, with the sensory um, approaches, we tend to want to do this piece of work at a point where they're in that optimal communication window because then they can engage fully in the session. But sometimes it may be, you may benefit from visiting it soon after an incident while it's still fresh in their mind. When we think about triggers, we are asking them to reflect on incidences. So this could be a trigger in itself. Um, so we just say, if concerned, have other members of the team in with you. And the key here is to know your patient well before starting this piece of work. You'll be tempted to share your own stories with patients to stimulate discussion, and this can be really useful to increase their understanding of the model, but we do need to be careful. So not only do we need to consider relational security, so we shouldn't be sharing overly personal experiences, but also you might find that you're putting words into their mouth and again, it might not be a true reflection of their experience. And lastly, this isn't a static document. So review is really important because the individual will continue to develop and will be learning more strategies, more coping skills. Um, it might be that at the start they lacked some of those interceptive skills. And through work with OT, actually, as they develop that, they can add a lot more to this sort of plan. And finally, you created it. Now what? So the point isn't just to create it and put it in a dusty drawer. Um, there are various areas that um, we found useful for using them in St Andrews. So through education, completing this piece of work is an opportunity to reflect on their skills and their communication style and how this changes. But it can also lead to more explicit teaching on polyvagal theory. But it can also help educate teams around the individual on the importance of their communication and the effect it can have on our service users arousal levels. Creating um, plans like this promotes use of communication strategies, coping skills and sensory strategies at an early stage. So the aim is always to prevent getting to that crisis point. Communication changes may be subtle, but being aware of these and what it could mean could mean that we can then intervene in the right way at the right time and reduce the need for restrictive practice. We found that during formulations, they can be used to highlight specific interventions that are needed to target particular areas. Um, and also when considering precipitating and perpetuating factors which are linked to the person's needs, it might clearly show that a factor might be that they struggle to communicate in a crisis. 
alternatively a protective factor in a formulation might be some of the strategies that we've been able to gather in the model. During debriefs, um, it can be used as a visual tool to support conversations about what happened. So were there strategies that weren't used early enough? What impact did this have? Where did some of the strategies, uh, were there some strategies that just didn't work? Can we remove them from the plan? Or did someone do something new um, that really helped? And then finally for handovers. So it's a really useful tool for handovers to new placements and to new staff. So it can be quite empowering for the individual to actively share this with other people. And the more they do this, the less anxiety we we see we tend to see that they feel when talking openly about their communication needs. It can also be shared with family members and could be useful to reflect on past experiences. Um, and what we've learned from St Andrews is that we can work more collaboratively as an MDT. So our aim is to try and make this more standard practice, to offer it to all admissions and to get that MDT group involvement from the beginning. Um, research completed at UCL, I think just last year, found that interventions blending behaviour and emotion programmes with language and communication interventions was more likely to be beneficial than working on these aspects separately. So much of our work overlaps and intertwines, so we need to make sure that we're no longer working in silos and we continue to work together. So we've got references again on the QR code if you're interested. Um, and that is the end of the presentation, if there are any questions. Is that Adam here? Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you, Kim, and thank you, for Leanne, for that super interesting webinar. Um, there were some really great practical examples in there, which I'm sure a lot of people uh, online will um, uh, find very useful. Um, so just to confirm, we will be sharing the presentations and slides afterwards. So please keep a lookout on the events section of, on our website for these. Um, and I know we've got uh, only <clears throat> a little bit of time for Q&A, so we will pose some questions to, to Kim and Le Leanne and um, get their answers uh, and post them on our website as well. Um, so I am going to spend a little time just um, uh, asking a few uh, questions and answers. Um, so thank you to all those that have submitted questions pre-webinar. Um, and um, and we go for a few now. So um, the first one we have, uh, Kim, is in your opinion, um, what would be some of the key um, speech and language practices that you would expect to see um, when a patient is first admitted to an inpatient service? Um, I think the key thing is obviously building rapport. Um, so as we've highlighted, a lot of the individuals coming into our care have maybe had um some experience of trauma in the past and and we need to be able to build up that rapport with the individual to make them realize that we are a trusted being and, and someone that wants to help them and, and work with them so it's often building rapport and getting to know that patient um and then eventually we work towards doing initial um assessments so we can build a profile of their communication needs um or their communication strengths as well um, and that's where we're trying to input the arousal curve. So if we can get that done as early as possible, um, then that's that's something that we can continue to build on whilst they're um, with us at St Andrews. Um, but the other key thing, I think, is recognising that a lot of our individuals haven't had speech and language therapy before. Um, so often it's it's sort of gone under the radar for whatever reason. Um, and it can be quite um, reassuring for individuals to have some explanation for why, you know, maybe they've always been labelled a naughty person, maybe they've always been labelled the disruptive person, and actually a lot of it might stem from their lack of understanding. So there are lots of things that we can implement early on, like timetables, easy reads, visual cards, communication books, um, to be able to support that, that person throughout their journey with us. Great, thanks. Um, and we had a question come in um, that said, um, why do you think that many professionals and organisations do not recognise communication as something to be addressed in its own right? So is this something that you you see quite regularly within your within your field? 
Yeah, I, I think it's um, my experience is often it's seen as a bit of a um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like a cosmetic thing to, to deal with. As in, like, it's a bonus if we can work on their communication. Um, and I do think part of our role of being SLTs working in mental health is to promote that actually good communication skills is required to access all other aspects of mental health care for these individuals. And, and that there's a big, um, you know, health disparity between those who have the language skills to be able to access these psychological um sort of verbally mediated therapies and those who potentially can't access it so I think it's it's I've seen a big change in the understanding of that recently um you know mental health care is still really young when you can consider it to physical health care and the input of SLTs and mental health care is is even younger so I think it's just something that we continue to have to advocate for um going forward oh, great so uh, I'll just go through um, a couple more questions because I know we're we're starting to run over. Um, we had a question here about um, that stated how how would you rate the arousal curve in comparison to the window of tolerance model? Um, so is there any particular reason why we use the arousal curve and not not the window of tolerance model at St Andrews? I don't know whether Leanne, have you got so the win you mentioned the window of tolerance, didn't you? Yeah, in relation to the <laughs> arousal curve. Yeah. I don't I, I don't think there's any reason why we would use one over the other. I think they both sort of complement each other and, and it's a similar um similar theory backing, isn't it, in a in a way. But my understanding of window of tolerance was also about how we can sort of extend that window of tolerance. Um, which I guess is slightly different to what we were talking about. Yeah, I was sorry, I was probably that was probably a mistake on my part. I was talking about it in terms of the window of communication on the arousal curve. Um, but I think, yeah, we've demonstrated a number of different. I think you pull in different theories and different models to help have a kind of holistic approach on something. So, I, yeah, I think we probably use a mix of things, don't we, to un better understand how to support someone. And um, finally, then we had a question um, that stated how how do you, that asked um, how do you address the arousal of support team or carers? So slightly not not kind of focused on the patient, but on the on the kind of carers who are supporting them, because um, mm -hmm. obviously they're crucial to a patient's kind of recovery and outcomes. So, um, is there any kind of thoughts towards that? Yeah. Um, I was just going to say, I think in St Andrews, we are very much looking at uh, common human um, issues. So, um, you know, the importance of health and well-being. And so when we do anything around uh, sensory approaches or arousal levels of stress, we often we often do it together with patients and staff on the ward. So it might be that we do a CPD on the ward and we look at it as everybody is a sensory being or everybody experiences um, stress and threat and so these strategies are helpful for everybody. There's also something we do, we're bringing into St Andrews, it's not everywhere but compassion focused staff support so again that idea of um, as humans we experience threat and what strategies can we use to help feel calm and connected and safe. So I think bringing things together with staff and patients can just help it be a common concern for everybody and that everybody can use those strategies. Yeah. Great, fantastic. Okay, so I, I think I'm going to kind of wrap up there. I know we're kind of um, slightly over time. So um, we will be sending out a short survey to invite your feedback uh, about the webinar and help us to plan for future events. As I said, we will um, um, supply a recording of this webinar um, and also um, pose any questions that we haven't managed to answer today to Kim and Leanne, um, and we put them, them answers on the website so that you can you can view them. Um, so we. Um, so this webinar is EPD eligible um, and finally on behalf of St Andrews um, a big thank you to Kim and Leanne 
uh, and to you all for joining our webinar. Um, we very much hope that we will be able to do more webinars in the future and we'll keep you informed on these events, um, which may be of interest to you. So thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.